John 17, beginning in verse 1. Jesus spoke these things. Having wrapped up all the teaching in chapter 15 and 16, he looked up to heaven, he took the posture of prayer, and he said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son so that the Son may glorify you. Now, the first thing I want you to note is this. He was excited by what his hour meant for God. He was excited about what his hour meant for God. Notice in the text, he, he gets to this place. And in the Garden of Gethsemane, we, we hear that he prays in the other Gospels. And he prays and he says, let this cup pass from me. He actually asks God to take it away from him. And then he says, not my will, but your will be done. But in this, he, he doesn't ask that question. He, instead, he's anticipating. He's excited. He's looking forward to it. He says, the hour has come. It's here now. And he says, glorify your son. Glorify means that you give honor to someone, that you elevate their reputation in the eyes of others. And so he, he's asking for God the Father to glorify him. Now, how in the world is that going to be the case? Because his hour meant that he was going to be unjustly tried that he was going to be spit upon. He was going to be slapped in the face. They were going to put a crown of thorns on his head and bang them down into his scalp. Uh, they were going to uh, tear off his clothes. They were going to whip him until an inch of his death. He was going to be all flayed open and bloody and nasty. They were going to take him outside the city gates because it was too shameful to do inside the city gates. And they were going to nail him to a tree, which the Bible says that anyone hung from a tree is cursed. Not only were they going to nail him, but they were going to do it for all to see. He was going to be beaten, bloody, bruised. He was going to be unclothed while all that was happening. And there is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords hanging from a tree. They did it that way so that it could be the most shameful display of a human that they could possibly think of. Yet in the most shameful moment of his life, he viewed it not as being shameful, but as glorifying the Son. How could that be something that glorifies the Son? Well, help me, church. When you sing to Jesus, when you praise Jesus, are you praising him because he walked on water? Peter walked on water, but we're not singing his praises. Not in this church, anyway. Uh, are you praising him because he fed the 5,000? No. What about he was a sinless guy? Are you, are you praising No. Are you praising him because all the miracles he did or all the teaching? No. Do you know why you're praising him today? Do you know why you're here today? It's because he died on the cross for you. Is that not why you're here? He died for you? If he had done all those other things but he didn't die for you, guess what? I'd say, Jesus, you're a great guy, but I'm going to do something else with my Sunday mornings. It's because that he died on the cross that we worship him and that we glorify him. It's because of his death. It's because of his hour. It's because he was faithful in that context that he would be glorified. But notice why he wants to be glorified. Glorify your son so that the son may glorify you. He does not say glorify your son so that I can become more famous. Glorify your son so that I can have a bigger house. Glorify your son so I can have a fancier car. Glorify your son so I can get more likes on Facebook. Glorify your son so I can have more followers on Insta Twitter. Glorify your son because... No. You see, we are motivated by those things. We are motivated by having those things, by those possessions and that fame and that fortune. We are motivated by our comfort. But what was it that motivated Jesus? Why did Jesus want to be glorified in that hour? It was because by Jesus being glorified, it would result in the glorification of God the Father. Think about it for a moment. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whosoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. 
For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. When we see Jesus on the cross, yes, we glorify him. But seeing Jesus on the cross leads us not only to glorify Jesus, but to glorify the God that loved us so much that he was willing to send his son to die for us. If you don't have this passage memorized, I would encourage you to memorize it. It's Matthew 6, 33. We'll put it on the screen so you can see it. It says, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. Right before that, he talks about don't worry about what you're going to wear. Don't worry about what you're going to eat. Don't worry about where you're going to stay. Don't worry about those practical things of life. The Gentiles go after them, but God loves you so much. He'll take care of those things. What you need to do is seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and he'll take care of all the rest. See, if our motivation is to honor ourself, if our motivation is to maintain our comfort, then when something becomes uncomfortable, we will not do that thing. If our uh, motivation is to maintain our peer group, then when something is out of step with that peer group, we will not do that thing. If our motivation is to make more money, when something that God asks us to do seems to give up that money, then we won't do that thing. If our motivation is fill in the blank other than God, and he calls us to do something, and it goes against our motivation, we won't do that. But if our motivation is to glorify God, then come hell or high water, it don't matter what he calls us to do, we're going to do it because we know that glorifies him. And so when you face your hour, and that challenge, and that difficulty, and God calls you to face that thing that may cause you to go, you need to check that motivation, and if it is to glorify God, then my friends, you'll live through it, but if it's not, you'll cower away. So the first takeaway is this, that when we face our hour, we need to make sure that we remember what it means to Him. Remember what it means to Him. Let me give you a second thing. Look there in verse 2. He's giving an argument for glorifying the Son, the Son glorifying Him. And he's saying, here's you know, why that all needs to happen. In verse 2, since you gave Him authority over all people so that He may give eternal life to everyone you have given Him. This is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and the one you have sent, Jesus Christ. He says here, secondly, he's excited, not by what it meant for God, but what is our meant for others. What is ours meant for others? Notice he alludes to the fact that the Father has given him authority. Now, the word give, it can mean I'm going to give you something like I'm going to give this Bible to you. Like that definitely can mean that. But it also means to appoint. And so if I give you a job, I'm going to appoint you to doing this thing. And so he has appointed him. And what has he appointed? He is appointed and given authority over all people. The word authority means that he, re he receives the responsibility, the ability, and the freedom to act within that responsibility. We see this three times in the book of John in which Jesus is given authority. In John 5, 27, he is given the authority to judge. So God holds the right to judge, but he delegates that and gives that to Jesus. Now Jesus has the responsibility, the authority, and the ability, and the freedom to judge. Then we see in John 10, 18, he's given the authority to lay down his life. What that means is that God does not hold a gun up to Jesus' head and make him go to the cross. Jesus goes because he wants to. Jesus could have said no. Jesus could have not gone. But he submitted to the Father, which was his right and his authority to do so. Now we see that he's been given a responsibility responsibility and the authority over all people. And what is the job? What is the responsibility? What is the authority that he has been given? It is to give eternal life to everyone you have given him. What is this eternal life? Notice it says that they may know you and the one you have sent, Jesus Christ. We've heard it once, we've heard it a thousand times. Eternal life and salvation is not something that comes by religion. It is something that comes by relationship. It is not an act that you do at church that saves you. It is not multiple acts that you do at church that saves you. It is not what you do that saves you. It is who you know that saves you. And if you know Jesus... 
It doesn't matter what you have done, you will be saved. And so he's saying this eternal life is to know God and to know Jesus, and I have been given this authority to give eternal life to those whom the Father has given me. Now, I don't have time to dig into the theological nuance of the ones the Father has given me. If you know, you know. I'm going to deal with it next week. Mark your calendar. We're going to deal with it next week. But the bottom line is this. His authority is universal in scope. He says authority over all people. It's universal in scope, but it's very narrow in application. It's only given to those who were given to him and entrusted to him. We're going to talk about who those are next week. Don't get all sideways on me. Just wait. Be patient. But the idea is that here it's broad, and now it is narrowed in its application. And we see this affirmed in 1 John 2, 1 through 2. What does that passage say? My little children, I am writing you these things so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He himself is the atoning sacrifice, the payment for our sins, and not only for ours, but for also the the other Baptists. I'm I'm glad I'm a Baptist. How about you? No, it's for the whole world. His blood was sufficient to pay for the sins of the whole world. Yet it only becomes applicable to those who accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Those who accept Christ, they receive that. Notice what the Bible says again in John 15, verse 13. Notice what it says there. No one has greater love than this to lay down his life for his friends. You see, Jesus knew that he had been given an assignment to provide eternal life for a lost and dying world. And if Jesus had shied away from his assignment, which was to go to the cross, the sins of the world would have never been paid for, and you would never have an opportunity to be saved. In order for you to be saved, he had to suffer. In other words, his suffering led to your salvation. Aren't you glad Jesus did that for you? He looked at that hour and he said, you know what? This is going to hurt me. This is going to be painful. This is going to be tough. But I'm willing to do it not only because of what it means to the Father, but what it means to the billions of people that need the forgiveness of of their sin, and he was willing to go for what it meant to others. I'm not going to dig too far into some of these hours. We'll talk about them here in a moment. But one hour that you and I might have is the hour and the challenge that we have as parents. The world has a way that it wants you to parent your children. Basically, it wants you to write over the deed of your leadership and give it to somebody else. Typically, to the government, and let them train your children in the way they ought to live. Y'all tell me if that's not right. And even if that's not the way it's going to work, then all of the TV shows, all of the media, all of the stuff out there is encouraging you to raise your children a certain way. And if you say, I'm going to raise my children God's way, now you become the black sheep. You're now an outlier. Now they begin to persecute you. You're not letting your kid have that. Well, how dare you? You must not love your kids. You're not giving your children unfettered access to the vilest of vile content in the world. How dare you not let your six-year-old have total access to all that? And so, parent, you are going to be held accountable for how you raise your children, and you will have to make a decision, am I going to honor the Lord or am I going to go with the flow of this, uh, of this old world around us? And you will have to take a stand that makes you look unpopular and not cool. 
In fact, your children are not going to like you for it. But you have an hour, parent, dad, mom, to where you've got to stand on biblical principles and it will be uncomfortable and you may have issues in your house, outside your house, when you're taking a stand. But can I ask you a question? Do you think it will impact other people when you face your hour? Do you think you facing that hour of parenting God's way, do you think that that will have any impact whatsoever on the children in your house? Yes! And so that's one example of how you living through your hour and not cowering and running from it, but standing firm on the promises of God will have an impact on others. And so the takeaway here is this. You need to be excited, anticipate your hour, not only for what it means to him, but what it means to them. What it means to them. Let me give you a third one. Look there in verse 4. I have glorified you on the earth by completing the work you gave me to do. Now, Father, glorify me in your presence with that glory I had with you before the world existed. He was excited by what his hour meant for him, for himself. Uh, notice he says, I've glorified you on the earth. He is referring both to his behavior and performance as he lived his life, but also on what he was about to do going to the cross. He's saying, all throughout my life, I have honored you. I have followed you. I've been obedient to you. I've glorified you by being obedient. And, I, and let me take just a quick aside. You do know God's love language is obedience. Did you know that? You honor him most when you are obedient to his plan for your life. You glorify him most when you accomplish what he has called you to accomplish. That is what glorifies God most. More than singing songs, more than giving tithes, more than preaching the gospel, when you are obedient to his call on your life. And think about something a little bit further down the road. Jesus was the most gifted person in the history of the world. He could speak. He was articulate. He was humorous. He was was intelligent. He could walk on water. I mean, he could do anything and everything. In fact, after he fed the 5,000, the crowds wanted him to become king. If he wanted to, he could have been the wealthiest. He could have been the most powerful. He could have been in charge of the entire world. Why didn't he? Because God's plan for him was not to do those things. God's plan for him was to go to the cross. My friends, God has gifted you, and many of you are articulate. Many of you are humorous. Many of you are smart. Many of you are, are charismatic. Many of you could do great things, and you've got to be careful not to do those things for you, but to do it for him. And he's saying, I was obedient to you, and in being obedient to you, I've glorified you on earth. Now, Father, I'm looking forward to you glorifying me. Well, how can that happen? Notice he says, specifically, glorify me in your presence with that glory I had with you before the world existed. You see, before Jesus came to Bethlehem, he existed and he was God. He was God in eternity past, the same as he will be God in eternity future. He was one with God the Father. They were together. Uh, when he said, let there be light, and there was a voice that was saying that, it was Jesus' voice that was saying it. When God was walking in the garden with Adam and Eve, it was Jesus' feet that was walking in the garden. Jesus has always been there, and he enjoyed glory in which he and God were together. But he set that glory aside when he was born, and he became one of us. Not that he ceased being God. He has always been God. He did not cease being God, but he set the glory aside so that he could be one of us. Uh, we were talking uh, this last week with our family. When he was 12, he went to the temple and, uh, with his family, and his family left, and he stayed behind, and they couldn't find him. And they came back, and they found him. You know what he's doing? He was teaching the teachers in the temple. All those fellows with the PhDs, all the preachers and the staff people were there. All the deacons were there, and they were being schooled by a 12-year-old. We may need that here. I don't know. I... And then it says he was beyond all of them. And then it says they took him home and he grew in stature with God and with man. What that means is he still had growing to do because he was one of us. He's still a 12-year-old kid. Think about it for a moment. That next year he was going to be 13. 
I bet Jesus had acne. <laughs> he probably needed braces. He lived the same life and existence that we lived. And I would argue this existence that we live is not the ultimate glorification of being in heaven with God. Is that a fair statement? He was looking forward not to what he could get himself on earth, but he was looking forward to what God would give him in heaven. He was wanting to return to that glory, and that was his ultimate goal. And if that meant going through that hour to get that reward, then he was willing to do it. Listen to what Philippians chapter 2 says. Philippians 2, 5 through 11 says this. Adopt the same attitude as that of Christ Jesus, who existing in the form of God, did not consider equality with God as something to be exploited. Instead, he emptied himself by assuming the form of a servant, taking on the likeness of humanity. And when he had come as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even to death on a cross. For this reason, God highly exalted him and gave him him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. It was the very hour that was his lowest that brought the favor of God that lifted him to his highest. My friends, I, I don't know what hour you have in front of you. I, I don't know what difficulty lay. I don't know what challenge God has for you. But I do know this. If you will maintain your faithfulness through it, the joy that you experience from God on the backside will outweigh the pain that you experience in that hour. Somebody help me with an amen on that. Have you ever done it and been through it? God will give you that glory and that reward as you go through that hour being faithful to him. It is worth going through the hour. In fact, Jesus says that much about the woman that has a child, doesn't he? Jesus says, I'm going to take his word for it, he says that the joy of the child outweighs the pain and the suffering of the labor for that child. And I believe that to be true about the hour that you face. Listen to Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 through 3. Therefore, since we also have such a large cloud of witnesses surrounding us, these witnesses are all people that had an hour. Let us lay aside every hindrance and the sin that so easily ensnares us. Let us run with endurance the race that lies before us, keeping our eyes on Jesus, the source and perfecter of our faith. For the joy that lay before him, wait a minute, the joy that lay before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, so that you won't grow weary and give up. The hour you face may be taking a stand as a godly parent. The hour you face may be man becoming the spiritual leader of your family. How scary is that? The hour you face, ma'am, may be submitting to the leadership of your husband. I think that's even scarier. It may be that you're being called to serve in ministry. God's calling you to vocational ministry. He's calling you to missions. This is your hour. It may be he's calling you to teach Sunday school in the nursery department. It may be he's calling you to work with college students or with middle schoolers. He's working on you. That's your hour to say yes to that. Singles. Your hour may be maintaining your purity in the midst of this dating game. Singles or widows, it may be maintaining your joy in the midst of being alone. Students, it may be maintaining your walk with Christ in the midst of the pressures of those around you who hate Jesus. It may be 
the hour of repentance and confession as God convicts you of your sin and your need to turn to Him. It may even be the hour of your death that you're facing. One of the scariest things is when you sense the voice of God in your heart bringing conviction over your sin and convincing you that you need Jesus Christ. Why is that so scary? Well, it's because when you give your life to Christ, you die to yourself. You die to that old way of life. You are called to give up that sin. You're called to trust that sin to Jesus. You're you're called to give the leadership of your life to Jesus Christ. That's scary. And there are many, like that rich young ruler. You remember him? What must I do to be saved? Go and sell all you have. Give up, die to yourself. Give up everything to trust me. And it says he went away sad. Why? Because he was wealthy and he was unwilling to. We all have things and he calls us to give them to him and to trust our life with him. And that's scary, but you may be facing that as your hour right now. Can you imagine if you were faithful in your hour, what that would do for him? Can you imagine if you were faithful in your hour, what that would do to them? And can you imagine if you were faithful in your hour, what that would do for your own self? You've never given your life to Christ. I know that he's speaking to you and he's drawing you and this is your hour. And I will tell you it may seem hard to give up and to trust and to turn and to repent. But I'll tell you, if you take that initial step of faith, Jesus Christ will carry you the rest of the way and it will be the easiest, most blessed thing that you've ever done. Help me. The same is true for the rest of you facing an hour that maybe I didn't even address. But you're facing an hour as you're attempting to follow Christ that scares you. And I will tell you, if you'll take that initial step of faith, He will carry you the rest of the way. If you live in the Lafayette, Louisiana area and are not currently active in a church, we'd love for you to visit us. You can find directions, service times, and what to expect on our website at fbclaf.org.